Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I'm Yi Sing, co-president of Cambridge Biosoc. Uh, today, it's the third session of our Summer of Science series featuring talks from our members. Our speaker today is Maria, an incoming fourth year mathematician who will be starting the equivalent of the uh, Masters of Mathematics at Cambridge very soon. Uh, she does biostatistics and last year she did, in, in summer, she did research on mathematical biology. Her talk today will be about 30 minutes long, followed by an, a Q&A session which will be moderated by Christoph, our co-president. So if you're on YouTube, feel free to post your questions throughout the talk. Or, and if you're on Zoom, feel free to, you'll have the chance to ask your questions in person during the Q&A session, or you could post your questions on the Zoom chat. Um, so yeah, to, the talk today will be an introduction to epidemiological modeling. And without further ado, I'll now welcome Maria to deliver her talk. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Indeed, yeah, I'm a math student and I still confess that I've never given a talk to biologists. So I don't know how this is going to work, but I hope it works well. I've tried to keep the mathematics fairly easy, but I know it won't feel the same for everyone. I also know that uh, some of you may have done a course on mathematical biology in your first year at university, but I'm not going to assume that. And in any case, I will share a feedback form at the end of the talk. Uh, so I'll be very grateful if you could let me know there uh, your thoughts on the talk in general, but especially how you found the balance between um, epidemiological content and mathematical content, because uh, I'd like to give more talk to biologists in the future. So I, I want to get that right. Um, cool, yeah, so uh, what are we going to learn about today? Well, first we are going to revise some very basic mathematics that we are going to use uh, to model epidemics. We are going to start to like um, very intro introduction to simple epidemic models. For example, we will make the SIR model, which you may have heard of in the news over the past half year. And then we are going to meet more epidemic models that are also quite interesting, uh, but that haven't been uh, that popular recently, but uh, yeah, I, th I think they are quite cool as well. And then, uh, depending on how I'm doing for time, uh, there's a bonus section where I introduce some more maths and then I add some uh, more things to the epidemiological models. But yeah, let's keep going. Uh, let's start with the maths background. So, well, just to make sure that everyone is like uh, with us, uh, what is differentiation? I'm sure you all have met derivatives in high school, but maybe there was a uh, long ago and it, maybe it's not fresh, so I think it's good to recap that. So a derivative is the, tells us how quickly a function is changing um, as the independent variable changes. So the independent variable can be a space, can be time, can be anything, but here for us today is going to be time because we are interested to know how um, biological processes in particular, how epidemic changes change as time uh, goes on progresses. And differentiation is a super useful tool uh, because many, many processes in biology, physics, and in real life can be phrased in terms of how quickly things change. And one reason uh, why they are useful is that derivatives allows us to find equilibrium or stationary points of functions where the derivative is zero, uh, that's a fixed point and the system doesn't change um, in, in that point. And yeah, the definition of a derivative is this uh, limit that we have here, but don't worry, like it's not important. And in practice, you never do this limit unless you are a pure mathematician. Uh, so you just know the derivatives of um, a few very common functions and, and use them to construct others. And yeah, a common example, uh, maybe from physics, um, is that velocity is the derivative of the spatial position because it tells us, velocity it tells us how quickly the spatial position is changing and acceleration is the derivative of the velocity because it tells us how quickly the velocity is changing. So yeah, I hope that's clear. And yeah, as I said before, it's important when a derivative is zero, it's also important uh, to study the sign of the derivative. When a derivative is positive, then it means that our function is increasing. So if our function depends on time, as we will assume here, it means that 
whatever quantity our function is measuring is increasing at time horizon. So this could be like this region here and uh, this region here as time progresses, uh, our uh, function uh, increases. On the other hand, if the derivative is negative, then we say that our function is decreasing and it means that we are reducing whatever quantity our function is measuring. It is, uh, it, it is going down uh, as time goes on. And then in between, we have the equilibrium, the fixed point where the derivative is zero. That um, from the graph, that means that uh, the tangent to the uh, curve at that point, it's uh, flat. So it's like parallel to the uh, time axis. And equilibrium points are, as I said, fixed points. And they are very important because at the fixed points, our systems don't change. And we are interested to study the equilibrium of uh, like biological systems or whatever we want to study, it's very really helpful to look for the equilibrium points. And we will do that when we go to, to epidemics, we'll formulate the models, and then we will set the time derivatives to zero, and then we will try to solve for the quantities uh, that give us these equilibrium points. And now, there are two important types of equilibrium points, uh, which are local maxima and local minima. So, in a local maxima, you can, oh, sorry, you can imagine yourself being at the top of the hill. And so if, if you move slightly away from it, imagine you have a ball, then you will fall uh, rolling down the hill. So we, we call them unstable equilibrium for this reason. Mathematically, it means that the second derivative of the function is negative, and the second derivative is the derivative of the derivative. But yeah, that's not important. Uh, what's important is that if we are in a local maxima or in a stable equilibrium, if we have a small perturbation away from um, our fixed point, then this perturbation grows in time, grows exponentially away from the equilibrium, and we won't return to the fixed point. On the other hand, if we are in a local minima, we can imagine ourselves as being in the valley of uh, between two mountains. And if we have a ball here, and we move it slightly, then it will oscillate a bit around, but then uh, friction will slow it down and it will eventually stop and return to the original point. So we call this local minima um, a stable equilibrium because if we have small perturbations away from it, uh, the perturbations will decay and we will return to the fixed point. That's like a very, very useful con uh, concept uh, to to take into account when studying uh, systems in real life to look at the stability. And yeah, they are so very important because what I was trying to say earlier is that if our function tends to a constant value, then it must be a fixed point because it doesn't change with time. And for this reason, fixed points usually control the long-term behavior because in most of the cases, when we have a system, then it first shows some initial behavior that's due to the initial conditions that we've given to the system, but then in most cases, it, the system eventually moves towards this fixed point and then it, like, it looks the same at every point in time. So that's why we want to study fixed points. And how do we study them? Well, mathematically, we look at the second derivative or we can directly look at like what happens if we just have a small perturbation away from the fixed point. Does it grow or does it decay? Cool. Now, let's move on to differential equations. A differential equation is equation relating an unknown function to its derivatives. So here um, we want to solve for the function y is a function of time. And here f is like any function that you can imagine that has like as many arguments as you want. Um, so this equation like unlike in a normal, normal equation that we learned in high school or like primary school where we want to solve for the independent variable, we want to solve for a number, we want to solve for x or for t at the time. Here we want to solve for the whole function for y of t. So we want to find what is the shape of the curve that has the behavior given by the differential equation. And this is quite abstract, so I think it's fair to look at the examples. So one fairly common and easy example of a differential equation is this one here, where the time derivative of a function is equal to the function itself times a constant. And this is exponential growth. Uh, if you know how to differentiate it, you can check that that this obviously works. Um, here, A is just a constant of proportionality that depends on the initial conditions, and it is the uh, 
value at time equals zero of the function y. But what's important is that the rate of the exponential growth is the original um, constant of proportionality. And we can have uh, more differential equations where we write down like a second derivative as well as the first derivative, or we can write, uh, I don't know if you're seeing that, uh, you, we can write like time implicitly. Uh, we can do like, yeah, time implicitly there. We can do many things, uh, but it's not important whether like you know how to solve them or not. If, if you study maths at university, you spend a fair amount of time learning how to solve like most of differential equations that we know how to solve, but what's important is that, or what's practical, is that there are many differential equations that we cannot solve analytically. Like there's no way to actually write down the solution in a like nice, simple way. But we know that the solution exists. Like pure mathematicians have some theorems that tells us like, you know, for any reasonable uh, enough differential equation, there's one solution that it exists. And then uh, applied mathematicians, then we take our computers and we give it to um, the computer and we solve the differential equation for the parameters that we want. So we can have the graph or we can have uh, like the numbers that tells us the evolution of, uh, of our function as a function of, of time without actually knowing how to solve it. So uh, for this talk, like it doesn't matter if you don't know how to solve differential equations. And just like in a school, we will have equations and then we will have systems of equation where we will have uh, to solve not just for one number, but for more numbers, we'll have uh, multiple variables. So X and Y, we can have systems of differential equations, which like the idea is just the same here. Instead of solving for one function, Y or X, we solve uh, for two functions and then they are related by this system. Uh, this is like a fairly simple one where like that's just the first derivative in terms of the functions itself, but we could have second uh, derivatives and like more terms and so on. And here, the same uh, practicality issues. You, like you probably know how to solve these uh, systems of equation, and you could imagine how to uh, like attempt to solve that. And here, um, I think the, the first one we can solve it analytically. Uh, the second one, I I don't think we do, but it doesn't matter because like. A is a computer can solve it for ourselves. So uh, that's really in practice everything we need. And B, it's very useful just to write down the system. And without actually finding the whole solution, we can um, gather evidence, gather um, information from the actual equations of our system. We can look for fixed points by setting the time derivative to zero. And we can study like more things like periodic orbits and like what's the behavior at infinity. And so on. there are many things that we can do. We can do a stability analysis. And often that's like all we need to study um, biological systems. So that's uh, still quite useful. So yeah, at this point, I think that's uh, all the maths that I wanted to tell you about for now. So. Let's move on to uh, the introduction to epidemic models, if everyone is uh, happy with that. Right, so the basic reproduction ratio that are not, we've been uh, hearing about it in the news for like, I don't know how many months now, but that is the expected number of secondary cases generated per primary case in a susceptible population. So we can write it in terms of the transmission rate and the recovery rate of like a, whatever infection we are trying to model and the total population size. But obviously we, we have ways to estimate it from the data that we have because we, we don't know exactly what is the transmission rate of uh, COVID or whatever, or like Ebola or whatever, we, we, we don't know it, uh, but there are ways to estimate R0 and it's a very useful parameter that comes up again and again when studying epidemiological models. And I should also emphasize that um, this is of independent of time. This is a fixed quantity. And in practice, we, we've, we've heard that oh, we want to keep uh, this ratio below one. But if, if it's something fixed from the infection, then how can we change it? Well, in practice, uh, like we can have an effective uh, basic reproduction ratio that comes from the behavior that we, as, like as a society, uh, acquire to like tackle the 
epidemic. So we, we try to keep like this effective R0 below one. So like we effectively reduce the transmission rate by like social distancing and uh, lockdown and quarantining and so on. So we want to keep it below one for reasons that will become uh, apparent later. But basically, if we have it below one, then it should be clear from the definition that, or maybe not clear, but intuitive, that from the definition that if we have R0 less than one, then are the overall number of cases that of uh, like active cases that we have is is getting smaller over time. So that is what we want to control the epidemic. And yeah, I think I should say uh, for coronavirus, I think it's like about three probably, but I think upper bounds are like eight or nine. So yeah, so definitely uh, above one, the actual like uh, R0, obviously we, as I said, we want to keep it below one, the effective uh, ratio. And yeah, here's R0 for other um, common infections. This table is taken from, well, this book by Killing and Rani, which I'll, I'll really recommend to anyone who's like maybe interesting to learn more about these kind of models uh, with perhaps more uh, mathematics than what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, and yeah, it, it also has quite a lot of applications to like real epidemics with like real data and they match like the predictions of the model to the, uh, to the actual data. So yeah, so I'll recommend that. Now, yeah, so uh, we'll get us with the SIS model. Um, here, the idea is simple. We have only like two possible states in which we divide our population. Individuals are either susceptible or infectious. Here, we, we are modeling an infection that does not give immunity to, um, to the individuals that survive the infection. And we are also assuming that nobody dies here of this infection. So for these reasons, the model is common to, uh, to study flus or uh, sexually transmitted infections because uh, individuals don't acquire immunity to it after, after having the infection. So here we have just two parameters beta, which is the transmission rate, and gamma, which is the recovery rate. So now, if we want to write down the model, then the rate of change, the time derivative of the number of susceptible individuals, well, we need to do two things here. Like the number of susceptible individuals is changing because some individuals are getting infected and some individuals that were infectious are recovering and are, are now susceptible again. So we need to subtract this, this Term here, these are the indi susceptible individuals that are becoming infectious. And this term is proportional to the transmission rate beta, but it's always also proportional to the number of susceptible individuals and the number of infectious individuals. And the reason for that is that, well, the more susceptible individuals that we have, the more individuals are going to get infected. And also the more infectious individuals that we have, the more susceptible individuals will get the infection. I think that uh, should be clear. And then we need to add the infectious individuals that are recovering. So they recover at a per capita rate gamma. So overall, the new recoveries are gamma i, where i is the number of infectious individuals. And likewise, for the rate of change of the number of infectious individuals, we basically flip the signs with above. We need to add the uh, new infected. So we are removing them from the susceptible compartment and bringing them to the infectious compartment. And then we need to subtract the number of infectious individuals that are recovering and we add them to the susceptible compartment. And finally, um, N is our total population size. And because here we only have two compartments, N is the sum of the number of susceptible individuals and the number of infectious individuals. And in this case, this relationship is very useful because we can write S as N minus I, and we can plug that into the equation for I, and then we get rid of S. And so that's exactly what I do here. Uh, I've written N minus I in terms of in, instead of S. And so uh, when, we have, when we have that, uh, then we can basically have, we just have a differential equation for the number of infected individuals, which uh, we can solve. Uh, and using the definition of R0 that I gave earlier, it, um, the solution looks like this, but it, it doesn't matter if you don't know how to solve a differential equation. Uh, 
you can just believe me that this, this one is the solution or you can uh, plug it in and check that it actually works or like you can just look at the graph that uh, a computer program produces for you and that's the solution to this SIS model here um well i should comment on two things um this case corresponds to the case where r not is greater than one um this solution shouldn't make sense in 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 the other case when r not is less than one because like this will be negative uh to start with if r not is less than one then we have no epidemic because the number of cases decreases but but if r not is greater than one then we do have like this initial exponential growth but then uh the system turns to the uh, fixed point uh, that I was telling earlier that control the long term behavior of the system. So um, here these are uh, the number of days um, after the initial infection. And, and this is all for like a reasonable set of parameters, the transmission rate and the recovery rate. So uh, at the end, like the system looks the same. It's a fixed point. The system is not changing in time. And I still emphasize that this is very important, but it, it is not that the no one is changing in time that everyone remains uh healthy or infected it means that like the system if you look at the numbers look the same but there are still people who are getting infected and infect and infected individuals who are recovering it is just like the numbers balance out so that there is no um overall change cool. now um the sir model so this is what we had before is that that now individuals um, that survive the infection uh, do not go back to the susceptible compartment instead we move them to a third recovery compartment and here in this recovery compartment that sometimes also called um, by epidemiologists also called as the removed compartment here we put individuals that have either recovered and gain immunity to the infection so no longer can get it or who have died because of the infection and we put them there and Epidemiologically, it's like quite the same to be dead or to be immune to the infection because it means that you cannot get it and you cannot pass it to anyone else. So uh, we just put them there. And in the mathematics, this means that we have to introduce uh, this third function of time, R. And the infectious individuals, instead of adding that term to the um, susceptible compartment, we put it into the recovered compartment. And then to obtain the total population size, we need to add the individuals that, were, that are in the recovery compartment. And then again, it's fixed. And here now, this is like, there's no uh, like a nice way to solve this as, as we had in the other model, uh, unfortunately. There are things we can study from it. Um, we can look and do like a stability analysis and uh, there's a disease-free equilibrium. So the disease-free equilibrium is the one where like we set to zero, uh, all the time derivatives and then we try to solve just for numbers um this system that's now like an, an algebraic system and if we solve that then we find that there's a solution where like everyone is susceptible and no one is infected no one is recovered and that's the disease free equilibrium and so we want to study what happens to the small perturbations away from this fixed point because fixed points um like the way we study fixed points is by considering a small perturbations away from it. So we approximate the initial number of uh, susceptible individuals as the total population size, which is like at the start of an epidemic, that is the case, like almost everyone is healthy. And then there's like maybe one or two ca initial cases and then uh, lead to like the whole epidemic. So we use the uh, equation here for uh, the I variable and we plug N there. So by making this approximation, we have this approximate differential equation for the number of infectious individuals, which we can write in terms of R0. And now we go back to what I said at the start about the um, sign of the derivative. So here, if R0 is less than one, then this is negative. So overall the time derivative, it's negative. So if the derivative is negative, it means that the number of cases decrease. So if R0 is less than one, then the number of cases decrease at the start of the epidemic. So like there's really no epidemic at all. Like we have like one or two cases, but then uh, decay and uh, basically nothing happens. If R0 is uh, greater than one, however, then this is positive. So it means that the numbers of cases do increase because at least initially, because this is positive. Then, so initially, uh, 
um, if, if you look at the form of, of this different, like this approximation, this differential equation, it's like the example I had at the beginning with the constant of proportionality, there's exponential growth. So while this approximation is valid, we do have exponential growth in the number of um, infectious individuals that's just given by this differential equation. Then this approximation, as, as we grow away from the equilibrium that's unstable, um, this approximation is no longer valid because we cannot longer approximate S as N. And so um, we'll have to do more mathematics, but then basically uh, we eventually reach a point, we reach a maximum and then the number of cases um, get decreasing. And if we use a computer to solve um, the system, uh, this is how it looks like, the three variables. So yeah, so the red curve is the number of infectious individuals. And yeah, yeah, these are the number of susceptible individuals and these are the uh, remove or recovery individuals. Something that's not perhaps clear from this diagram is that not everyone needs to get infected for the epidemic to uh, go away. So uh, usually there'd be like a small fraction of the population that wouldn't have gotten infected, but then still like, because there are so, uh, so because most of the population is immune to the uh, infection, then like it doesn't have people to transmit. And so there are a few individuals like some proportion of the population that doesn't become infected. And, and yeah, that's uh, herd immunity, which uh, yeah, uh, we've heard on the news. Cool. Now, vaccines and uh, vaccination model. Now, what happens if we have a vaccine and we vaccinate a proportion P of the population. So we basically need to change, uh, slightly modify slightly our equation for the SIR model, but it just means that like of everyone who will have gotten infected, if there was no vaccine, then only a proportion one minus P will actually get infected because a proportion P of them, a fraction P of them do have the vaccine. So they are effectively immune, they are immune to the infection. So we just need to change the transmission term in the um, equations of the SIR model, and, and we write this factor of one minus p, and then everything else is as before. So the condition that we had to have no epidemic when there was no vaccination was R not uh, less than one, or equivalent uh, equivalently it, it will look like this. So beta n less than gamma. If we introduce vaccination, we are just like replacing beta by beta times one minus p. So it looks like uh, this inequality here. And we can rearrange the inequality uh, using the definition of R0 for it to look like this. And this is very helpful because um, if this inequality is satisfied, then we have uh, like the epidemic slows down. We have like an effective R0 that's uh, less than one, basically. So it doesn't mean that like we have, we don't need to vaccinate everyone for the um, epidemic to go away. And it should also be intuitive that the higher R0 is, then uh, this quantity becomes very small. And so this inequality, like the, the left-hand side here will be like quite close to one. So we will have to vaccinate almost everyone if R0 is uh, very large. Whereas if R0 is quite small, then this is like not as close to one as, as on the other case. And obviously if R0 is less than one, then this, this term here, that's greater than one. So we're all like, this is negative. And so uh, this proportion is like, this inequality is trivially satisfied because uh, the, a proportion is a, like non-negative number and this will be negative. So if or not it's less than one, uh, yeah, this doesn't, like, it doesn't matter how many people you vaccinate, like it's still going to work. Uh, but that's for the obvious reason that it works without a vaccine uh, if or not it's less than one. Now, if we plot that like the critical vaccination fraction that uh, we need to control the epidemic, so that will come from like setting an equal sign there. If we plot it, uh, the curve looks like this. And so here, these are like common infections and and they're like corresponding R0 or estimates for R0. And, and these are the uh, vaccination fractions that should be enough to control the epidemic. Cool. So at this point, uh, if everyone is all right, I think we are going to move on to the uh, third chapter. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll make a like a quick break, like um, thirty seconds, or like if people want to breathe, or like uh, I'll just drink some water.
Okay, cool. I'm, I'm always very bad time in the breaks. Um, I, I don't know how long it lasted, but um, yeah, so here's the um, final chapter on like more epidemic models. Now that uh, th this is going to be less mathematical actually than, than the other one, but now you got the idea of like, okay, how to like um, write down a model and like what things can we learn from it. So one very useful one is the um, is this one where we introduce the expose compartment, this expose class. Um, this corresponds to, this is useful for infections that have a latent period where an individual is already infected, but he's no longer, it's not yet infectious because the host hasn't grown enough uh, within uh, that person uh, for it to become like transmissible to go outside. And if you, if you were to write down the model, then you will have to introduce uh, another variable, uh, E, and, and you will basically just write down the equations uh, you will put the transmission term, these uh, individuals that get infected, and we're going to the infectious compartment uh, in the SIR model. Here they will go to the exposed compartment, and then uh, at a certain rate, given by the uh, uh, average um, period of latency, then they will go into the infectious compartment, and then they will recover. And like, you think, well, like this is just like the same. This is just like a time lag, but it's actually very helpful because. Is slower, it can be shown that there's a slower growth rate than in a simple SIR model after pathogen invasion. And uh, it's the rate of the exponential growth uh, looks like this for like uh, reasonable numbers. So these are for, for different values of R0 and uh, from different values of the latent period, that's the rate of the exponential growth. And so obviously uh, the, we want a small exponential growth and the greater the latent period is, the better, because it means that uh, so like the infection doesn't have time to uh, spread as quickly if, they, if it, fares, it is first in individuals that have it but are not infecting people. So like that's quite uh, neat, I think. Now, another model is uh, this one, or we introduce a career state, a career compartment, where we put individuals that are continuing to infect are infecting others, but they don't suffer the disease themselves. So it's like sort of like asymptomatic. And I think this is like is the case in some, um, uh, yeah, in some diseases. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm a mathematician, so I'm not going to uh, <laughs> discuss that. And and there are some cases even where like this individual switch from being in the carrier state, from like not being uh, infected themselves to to be in the infectious itself and then showing symptoms again and then going back to the carrier state and switching like at a certain like probabilistic uh, rate. And then eventually like those who are on the infectious compartment, they can recover. And again, like you will write down differential equations where you will have like a variable C for the individuals in the carrier state and like they will switch uh, back and forth at a certain rate and eventually recover uh, everything as before. And well, uh, well, yeah, I should say that all the graphs here are taken from the book by Kilin and Rwani that I men mentioned at the beginning. Um, this is how it looks like, uh, like the number of susceptible infectious and carrier individuals uh, depend on obviously the fraction of infectious individuals that eventually become carriers because uh, like not everyone becomes carrier when they in, in this infectious, like some individuals just recover and are immune to it and, and everything as normal. So this is how it looks like, uh, like for different uh, fraction of individuals that become carrier, the higher the fraction is, uh, the less susceptible individuals that we have. And, and obviously the more, the, the higher the fraction is, the more uh, carrier individuals that we have. And yeah, my intuition for this is that, well, if you move people to the carrier compartment, like even if they were switching back, there's like, there's less chance, there's a space, there's less time for them to move into like, the recovered compartment is like less opportunity for them to actually recover. And yeah, so this is how it looks like if like uh, you um, solve the model, basically, if, if you write the equations and solve the model for, for a reasonable set of parameters. And now, yeah, there's uh, really no, no reason why we should stop here. You can just look at any infection that you're interested to model and think like, okay, what are like the biologically uh, like reasonable 
compartments to put in. So one is uh, in for in some cases there are some diseases that babies are born with immunity to um, due to like maternal uh, protection. So they are originally they are immune to it, but then eventually after some months they become susceptible again. So we need to make a compartment for them. Uh, so that's the M here, um, SIR model. Oh, that's known as passive immunity. If uh, but uh, I might be wrong. And then they move. Then we have like the SIR model uh, as usual. Uh, they move into a susceptible compartment, then infectious, and then recover. And yeah, you can study that as well. Uh, and and the, this one also like you can introduce like um, vital dynamics to study like the natural growth of the population as well. If there was no epidemic and, and this would show some effects because uh, obviously like this is like age dependent because only the individuals here are like all quite young. Then we can have SIRS model where um, we have a temporal immunity after recovering from the infection. So like the immunity uh, is waning and I think this is the case for months. Hopefully not for coronavirus. Um, but yeah, um, I think I, I didn't show the plot here, but I think the result is that there's an average time that the uh, immunity lasts for. And as you might expect, the longer the time that immunity lasts for, the better it is for like the whole epidemic to be controlled. So, um, so yeah, obviously, if, if there is uh, no at all, like there's no time where you are uh, immune to it, you are just directly susceptible, then the SIS model that we saw at the beginning. But this, this is something like in between the SIS model and the SIR uh, model that we, we, we saw at the previous section. And finally, um, we can have like no recovery at all. Like we just have SI model, uh, for example, for HIV or for like animal infections as well. Uh, that is the case. And, and yeah, this one is like fairly simple. You just switch to the other. And, and I think the mathematics here like will simplify because obviously the more, obviously the more compartments you have, um, like the harder the algebra becomes. And yeah, you could have more compartments. You could have like one for asymptomatics or like a uh, queue for quarantine individuals. Like uh, me, myself at the moment just arrived in the UK. Um, and here, like the the uh, the important thing is like, for, for these cases where like it depends on like the behavior of us as like humans, like the rates will change because uh, I'm having contact with less people, so like the transmission rate will be um, much smaller and, and so on. Yeah, yeah um, finally, uh, I think I'll close uh, with uh, this model um, for mosquito vector uh, infections. Uh, here, um, mosquito, yeah, mosquito vector infections. So here, humans become infected when they are bitten by a mosquito that's infected, but they do not transmit the infection to other humans and mosquitoes become infected when they beat a human that's infected. And here, what we have to do is put a susceptible and infectious compartment for mosquitoes and susceptible infectious and recovery compartment for uh, humans. And yeah, the questions like you will have more terms, but basically it looks like this here. We have to introduce uh, the rate at which a particular human is bitten by a mosquito and then the probability of transmission when a um, an infected mosquito bites a human, um, and, and the transmission probability when a mosquito bites an infected human, what's the probability that the mosquito then becomes infected? And if you write down the equations, it will look like uh, this. So the transmission terms are proportional to the number of infected mosquitoes and susceptible humans, or number of infected humans and susceptible mosquitoes. But yeah, without going into the details, uh, if you solve it, this is how it looks like. And yeah, the actual like details of the forms of these graphs is like really not important, but uh, I think, yeah, like the idea should be like, okay, this looks a bit different to what we had before. And it's also like quite nice that we can study this uh, uh, using maths. And yeah, I'm going to skip the final section, but uh, I will share these slides. Uh, you can have a look uh, at it if, if you want. Um, yeah, I hope you have uh, like enjoyed the talk and yeah, looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much for that talk, Maria. And I think we do indeed have a question from, already have a question from the YouTube live stream. So 
Is the SECR model uh, used for COVID-19 given the high number and probability of asymptomatic individuals or are there any more complex models? Oh, um, obviously, yeah, like, first of all, a disclaimer, like, I'm not doing any COVID, like, I, I don't know how it actually, like, they are doing it. And, like, they are having, like, even more complicated models that depend on, like, the age of the individuals, because, like, you, you have more contacts between individuals of the same age and, and so on. Uh, but, yeah, that's um, quite interesting. I think uh, they just put one uh, that's, like, asymptomatics, uh, not called like carrier state, because uh, the thing here is that individuals in the carrier state have all been infectious at some point. So like here you will know, but like you had it at some point, so like be careful. Whereas where asymptomatics, like it will go like straight from susceptible. There will be like a voice here for asymptomatics and like people wouldn't know that they are there. Whereas if you had the infection in, a, in like in this model, you, you will like suspect that. Uh, you might actually be infecting others. So yeah, so that's, that's my intuition for it, but uh, yeah, I, I don't have like a clear answer. Thank you for that. And of course, if the person asking the question is interested in more about uh, COVID-19 and modeling COVID-19 specifically, uh, we also have a talk from Dr. Lydia Restiff recorded on our channel. So if you'd like something that's more specifically about COVID-19, you could go and check out that talk as well to supplement uh, what we've learned today. Um, do we have any more questions on the live stream or on the Zoom chat? If I think I'll just squeeze in uh, one question for myself. So this is perhaps a bit out there, but um, for example, the mechanism of uh, iron transmission and creating uh, a particular potential difference in nerve membranes was determined from the equations and from the electrophysiological data. So have there been any cases that you might be aware of where the mechanism of a disease was uh, elaborated from uh, a mathematical model, so how it spread? Oh, um, that's a good question. Uh, the like simple answer is that like, I have absolutely no idea, but uh, my intuition is that like, sounds very reasonable that like uh, out of like all the like many diseases that there exist like some might have come from this uh, but yeah like I mean like there's people who do like biophysics that maybe studied like how that like the molecules are like that sort of thing works um, but uh, yeah I mean that's I, I would say like that's not my area of expertise although like I don't have any area of expertise but yeah Sorry. No, I think it'd be an interesting subject to look into whether mm -hmm. uh, one could, or, or perhaps maybe my, my personal intuition is that perhaps it's easier to uh, sequence uh, a particular pathogen and compare it to the other ones that we've se sequenced already, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. rather than working from that sort of data de novo, perhaps, but uh, an interesting topic nevertheless. And do we have any further questions from uh, the Zoom live stream or from the YouTube live stream? I think we might have one more. Um, yeah, I actually have a question. So yeah. um, there was a graph where you, that you showed and you mentioned that when the number of carriers increase, increases the number of susceptible individuals decreases yeah this one decreases yeah. um so yeah i was looking at the, the the graph for in infectious people and it's um it's constant so yeah because i, I didn't have much time to think about it yeah. but is it correct yeah. that basically because when there are more carriers um so when when the number of carriers increases and the number of susceptible people goes goes down because um, I is in between S and C. So I just um, becomes constant. Yeah, um, that, that, that's a very good question. And I like, I, when I put the graph, I, I thought about it and I was like, hmm, doesn't make sense. And I think a warning is that, well, for this particular, 
case, the fraction of like the, the, the yeah, because these are like obviously proportions because we, we, we can have like non-integer number of individuals. But anyways, at least a proportion of infectious individuals is like very small that uh, like maybe in absolute terms, like the change from like increasing the um, fraction that becomes carrier, like you cannot actually uh, observe it on the graph. And maybe if you would like to do, like if you were to plot it on like relative, like on a bigger scale, then you may have observed some change, but it's still the, like, it looks like very flat. And, and yeah, that's like interesting, but I think um, the number of susceptible individuals should decrease because there being more carriers, it means that more people will get infected because of the carriers passing the disease into them. But then if more people get infected, then like there should be more infectious individuals, but on the other hand, like they are recovering at the same rate and some of them are also becoming carrier. But yeah, I, ha I have mixed feelings about it. And, and it, it's, it's a good question you know, that I don't know the answer of certainly to it. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. And do we have any more questions from either the live stream or from the Zoom chat? Maybe if I uh, can ask just one more question about how, how would you specifically determine which model is best? Because of course, uh, the simplest model is going to be usually the best model. But how would you compare between uh, various models that could be used to model a disease and well, how accurately they represent, may represent the truth. Okay, uh, so yeah, so I think you want to like think, okay, what are you actually going to model? So, and these are like very like simple models and in this case like, well, for COVID then you really need something like a carrier state or like better as we said before like an asymptomatic compartment and for other infections that like have some like other qualitative difference then like it should be clear which compartment to put but then actually like epidemiologists do add more features to this like they include like age structures uh, to model like how do like children populations interact with um, adult populations and like for different age groups or like if, if it's like um, uh, sexual infection, then uh, they may have like different high risk, uh, like risk groups according to like high number of partners, or low number of partners. Or if if you have like a very small population, then like stochasticity, stochastic effects become important. So like you can have like random fluctuations that will make your graphs look a bit like, well, like like the uh, financial markets that like are not like really deterministic uh, smooth uh, curves like this year. And another one, so like spatial models where like you look how the um, epidemic spreads through the population. So um, I'm sure there's obviously some like checking after after the model is done and like comparing with the data and see like, okay, which one fits better. But I guess when you are doing like live epidemic modeling as the epidemic is happening and maybe you don't have like clear data, you just have to trust like your intuition or like past um, epidemics and think, okay, what's like the relevant feature about this epidemic and try to incorporate that into your model. Mm -hmm. So modeling features in particular, rather than the whole epidemic at once. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for answering that. And for, well, if there are no more questions on the live stream or on the group chat, I think we'll wrap up here. So mm -hmm. once again, thank you Maria for uh, joining us and for delivering our third summer of science talk. Thank you everyone who could join us through the live stream or uh, through the Zoom uh, group call. And we will also have, of course, our varsity ski event coming up from the 22nd to the 26th of December, uh, December, September. So it'd be great if everyone could join us for that. Um, we'll have four uh, keynote speakers. We already have 36, 30, 37 registered speakers confirmed and we'll post the full schedule this Thursday 
So once again, thank you very much, Maria, for joining us and for starting off with a very clear introduction to mathematics for those of us who might have done mathematics from, let's say, GCSE or A-level up to uh, complex models uh, explaining complex biological phenomena. So thank you once again. And okay. if you haven't, and everyone else, if you haven't subscribed uh, our Biosoc channel, uh, do subscribe to keep updated with our talks. Uh, follow our Facebook page and our Instagram to find out more. And in that case, I think what I'll do now is just end live stream. So thank you very much for joining us. And oh, is there a question? There is a question. Uh, sorry about that, Maria. That's fine. Uh, when was the idea of live mathematic uh, epidemic modeling first introduced? And how do you think that this idea has progressed over the years? Oh, I think like the simple models like have been known for like probably more than a century, like SIR model and so on. Um, but when I, they actually started doing uh, life modeling i am less uh, sure about it um so when well, like when i was like trying to learn some of this stuff uh like the, the book that i mentioned did have like some like reasonably old records from like the first half of the 20th century uh where like they try to like may maybe they have like the number of cases of some childhood infection in in a school or something, and then they will try to match it. But, um, but yeah, it's it's like actually doing it live and not just like looking back to the data. I have no idea, but I uh, think uh, should be like uh, less than like hundred years. That that would be my best guess, but I'm 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 not uh, sure at all about it. Thank you for answering that. And I think in that case, I, I won't do a conclusion again, but once again, thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully see you soon. <laughs>